Uh, we have uh, philanthropic, um, so the Sequoia Climate Foundation, Yasmin Moazinia. We have uh, private, private climate asset manager, uh, Ollie Crouch, um, and uh, an NGO perspective, um, and a long-term gold standard ally, actually, uh, in Harry Clemens of the Fair Climate Fund. And um, what we're going to try and do with this session is to work up an understanding and a definition, or maybe not a, you know, a final definition, but a, a kind of working understanding and definition of what just transition is and why it's important. And we are going to want to hear from you as well. So we are going to spend a bit of time with our panel working through that um, and learning you know, from all of them how they're going about their work, why their work is important, and to give us some examples to improve all of our understanding. Um, and then we'll do an exercise with all of you to understand who's in the room um, are you already working on this and did we miss anything in our definition? And then I'm hoping we can close with a bit of back and forth um, Q&A with the audience. So I'll be uh, ably assisted by my um, colleague Felicity Spores, who's just entered the room at the back there. So um, uh, she's going to make you participate. So look out for that uh, in a minute. So um, with that, let's um, make a start. I'll start because um, you're sat right next to me. So we'll start with Ollie. Um, Ollie, if you could share um, what um, climate asset management, you know, what is your definition? You know, why do you think it's so important? And maybe if you could share some examples from your work, that would be super. Absolutely. Right. So um, a little bit on climate asset management first. So as you said, we're a, a sort of private sector asset manager. We're, we're a JV between a sort of climate advisory firm called Pollination and HSBC. Pollination really had the vision for a, um, an asset manager that, that scaled investments into to net zero, knew their advisory firm you know, wasn't the right vehicle for that and went looking for someone that shared their vision. So that was the, the partnership, really focused on scaling regenerative investments into, into nature. So, you know, sort of protecting biodiversity and supporting livelihoods very much within, within the DNA of the firm. So we've got two funds within our platform. We have a, a fund that acquires land, forestry and agricultural assets, uh, and it makes me smile because we call that the real assets fund. That's not the carbon fund. <laughs> um, and that is very much focused on um, delivering financial return to the investors. So we're you know, monetizing the timber, monetizing the agricultural commodities, but fundamentally introducing a more regenerative management um, program you know, for that land. Um, and then we have the carbon fund, um, which is uh, the team that I'm part of where we are um, building out a portfolio of high quality, high impact, um, landscape scale nature-based solutions under the gold standard, under VERA, um, and we're really a retirement vehicle. Um, so I think that's a sort of point of differentiation versus some of the other funds that are out there. Um, we hear a lot about sort of the integrity challenges that this market has, but you know, fundamentally we have a, a lack of demand challenge and, and we are, you know, we're very much building, you know, we, we represent demand, we are, we are a retirement vehicle. So from a carbon perspective, you know, we're flowing investments into, into the global south. And really as we think about the, you know, the just transition, it's really about, you know, not leaving anyone behind as we advance on this, you know, equitable and inclusive, you know, transition for both people and the planet. Um, it's particularly relevant for the Carbon Fund, um, which is the team that I'm in, um, where we are, you know, often working with the more sort of economically uh, marginalised communities, um, you know, versus that developed markets fund, which is acquiring forestry and agricultural assets, sort of le less of an interplay. Um, so, in terms of how we go about, you know, delivering that just transition on the Carbon Fund, you know, as I said, it's in our sort of DNA in terms of the the purpose and the mission uh, of the business. We are a sort of regulated you know, entity. So we have this sort of European regulatory framework for funds, EU taxonomy that sort of codifies a whole load of stuff around you know, human rights and employment matters. You know, again, that perhaps other carbon players um, you know, aren't, you know, aren't covered by. Uh, we have our, you know, like most, we have our impact framework aligned you know, very well with the gold standard and the, and the other carbon standards that are out there, you know, where we have to demonstrate that we're having a you know, substantial contribution to both climate, community, biodiversity, and water. And that sort of gets operationalized through our investment criteria where we need to, you know, demonstrate that an investment is delivering on at least three of those four. So, you know, in theory, you could have investments that don't deliver, on, you know, community could be the one that's left out, but in reality, you know, particularly on the carbon side, um, you know, all of the, the investments that we're advancing are, are delivering for the community. And sort of by design, you know, we have a benefit sharing mechanism you know, baked in to how we structure those investments, you know, because, you know, partly because we just think that's good business in terms of, you know, creating that longevity and permanence of the, of the activities. Um, 
but we're, as a fund, you know, we have a 15-year uh, term. So we're looking to pre-finance restoration activities, receive carbon credits in return, um, and then ultimately hand those, you know, activities over to the, to the stakeholders, to the communities um, that are driving those, those projects forward. Um, you know, but even over that 15-year 50 year period, we, you know, we ensure that we never take 100% of the credits. Um, in return for our investment because we know that it's very important for those communities to receive, you know, beyond the co-benefits of the program, you know, which are multiple, they need to receive a, a share of the credits as well. And so we would put in places specifically around the community credit share, you know, transparent mechanisms, put obligations on the partners to monetize those at the prevailing market price and have, you know, transparent processes, you know, ideally trusts with safeguards in for how those funds are distributed to the communities. And as I said, that's really in addition to the co-benefits. Right. Um, and then from, a, you know, from an FPIC perspective, you know, that's enshrined within the, the carbon standards that, that we work with. Um, what we find is that they're often sort of incremental, sort of host country FPIC requirements that, that sit on top of that. That's obviously is, you know, of primary importance to the host country that you're working in. Um, and you know, with all the projects, obviously we're you know ensuring that the communities you know express a willingness to participate, understand what they're getting into, and you know that there are processes around you know helping community members understand contracts, helping them sign contracts, you know making sure that that, that piece is is well covered off. I think you know you, you asked a little bit about the some of the risks that we see sort of in, in the just transition, and. You know, we certainly see a sort of reputational and, and contract risk around the price we might agree with a project mm -hmm. in the community for the carbon credits that we're pre-financing. You know, what happens over the next 15 years, you know, to that sort of investment price versus, versus yep. the market price? And is there a risk that these sort of communities step back from these contracts? And again, we try and address that through a number of mechanisms. You know, one, we are a retirement vehicle. So we sort of reduce that perception of super profits. You know, we represent demand. You know, we're making an investment today. You know, that said, if I'm a community member, I don't necessarily care about that. And if I'm, you know, missing out on what I perceive to be, you know, much higher market prices, that remains a risk. So we will always finance, you know, an early benefit, you know, financial benefit sharing mechanism for those communities to make sure that activities are, you know, budgeted for and well funded long before you know, the first credit issuance, with the, which with these nature-based projects is often often well down the line. Um, and then in addition to that upfront payment component, you know, we'll, we'll always try and structure a payment on delivery right. portion of the investment where we can create a sort of market linkage um, to price. Um, you know, so maybe I'll sort of stop there, but that, those right. are sort of some of the, the considerations. Thank you, yeah. And I, 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 one thing you said that's interesting there was it's in, in your DNA, but I mean, it's. It's obviously not in many private companies' DNA, right? That's part of the problem. So how, how does a, a private company come to value a holistic, just benefit-sharing approach, do you think? Like, where did that DNA come from, and what can we learn from that? I mean, I think that, that DNA really came from, you know, uh, you know, Pollination, who had the sort of, you know, the vision uh, for this business. And, you know, they then sort of went, you know, out looking for a financing partner that shared that vision. You know, HSBC has got a sort of great, well, a good reputation as one of the sort of most sustainable banks. Um, and so, you know, the, the aspiration is really, you know, to build the largest, you know, asset manager, you know, dedicated to, to regenerative investments into nature. Amazing. And, and in terms of, I guess, the, the, the vision for handing over to communities, to what extent does sort of the resilience and the sustainability of the activity itself, I often think with um, anything to do with agriculture, for example, we get very hung up on additionality, but you almost need it to become non-additional if it's going to survive, right? So, so to what extent are you trying to leave a, a community with something they can run for themselves afterwards? I mean, great question. I think it, it very much depends on, on the type of project. So if I look at some of the, you know, some of the investments that we've made, you know, we have a, a very large scale sort of smallholder farmer agroforestry program, you know, working with, with farmers that introduce trees, you know, to their small holding. And the you know, in terms of enrol enrolling those farmers, you know, we're not even talking about carbon, you know, until the very end of the process. Right. It's about, you know, farmer managed natural regeneration, all these co-benefits that deliver resilience to your smallholder farm. And it's, you know, we're not introducing carbon to that conversation. So that program is designed to stand, you know, on its own in terms right. of the co-benefits. You know, other, other opportunities that we're looking at, there's a 
uh, a sort of grasslands restoration sustainable grazing program that we're, we're financing and there the co-benefits are, are more limited and under that program you know we're working with sort of community herders to introduce more you know rotational more sustainable grazing practices and there you know there's pro there's a you know a, a modest improvement in terms of the, the carrying capacity of the land for cattle you know which is a, a co-benefit for the farmers but the primary benefit that's driving that behavioral change is around you know the financing from yep. from the sale of carbon credit so you know that one is very much you know still requires a well-functioning right. carbon market sort of that agroforestry program could probably sustain itself you know even if the carbon finance falls away so it's a little bit, a bit of a know, depending yeah. on the, on the yeah. methodology and the, and the type of intervention brilliant thank you um i'm a standards guy so we'll go in a straight line around the room um barbara it, it would be great to hear obviously um ebrd known as a, a sort of market economics development um multilateral and i know your uh, particular background and expertise in in uh, the economic development around gender how does ebrd define um, just transition, you know, w w why does it value it so much? And maybe if you could give us some examples from your work. Okay, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least everybody woke up. Um, <clears throat> so um, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, as you say, EBRD, we invest um, about three quarters of our investments in the private sector. We have a mandate to um, support our countries of operation to become sustainable market economies. That means economies that are green, but also that are inclusive. Um, and we have, as, as an organization, three key strategic priorities. One is green investments, one is equality of opportunity, and the third one is digital. And it's really about combining those. So in a way, that already has the just transition element sort of baked in, if you want. Um, we invest about 11 billion euros um, per year across um, about 40 countries of operation, from Estonia to Egypt and Morocco to Mongolia. Um, and we do that across a broad range of, of different sectors, as I said, primarily in the private sector. So if, if you look at just transition, what does that mean for us? Um, in a way for us, uh, it's important to combine our expertise and investments in the green sectors with our focus on, on inclusive investments. So it's the gender smart, inclusive green and, and climate investments that, that, that are really uh, important. Why do we do it? Um, because ultimately, uh, we strongly believe that if you want to achieve um, a, a sustainable tomorrow, if you want to tackle climate change, you need to give people an opportunity and a stake in it. Uh, and if they don't have a stake in it, if they don't see the opportunities, jobs, livelihoods, etc., that come from that, and they share in this new greening economy, including greening jobs, um, then uh, you can't take the sometimes very difficult political um, economic uh, decisions that are required to change how we live and work and how we do business. So I think the rationale uh, for us in that context is very clear. If we look at the EBRD region, um, it, the EBRD region has about 11% of the world's global coal um, reserves. Wow. So that's quite substantial. It's particularly in Poland, in, in Kazakhstan, um, and in Ukraine. Uh, and um, that coal produces about a quarter of the region's energy. And in some parts of the region, particularly in the Western Balkans, that goes up to 70%. There are millions of jobs directly linked into that sector. So if you want to transition, you have to look at those millions of jobs and millions of livelihoods and many, many more millions of people that are directly and indirectly affected by that change. Um, and, that, and that's, in a way, exactly what we do. So how do we go about that? We, in, we, in, we combine our green investments, as I said, with a focus on, on workers and uh, reskilling, upskilling, uh, working both with our clients uh, on um, trying to understand are there opportunities for redeployment, are there opportunities for upskilling, reskilling, can we work with the local and regional um, job centers, um, education authorities, or, or regional development agencies to look at um, opportunities in this context. What are the opportunities to exist within the local or maybe even the national labor market. And then the third area, very important, is, re is economic uh, diversification. So uh, this is where other investments can come in that can come from us, that can come from, from other partners. Uh, we have a very strong program that focuses on uh, building the capacity of SMEs uh, coupled with SME investments and finance. So, so looking at what we can do uh, in this context. But it's those three elements. It's green investments, so basically from coal, say, to renewables. It's the focus on, on the people directly affected and then it's, it's the focus on, on the regions. So um, you asked for some examples. Yeah. Um, maybe I give you, I start with one and then I can come back with, with others later on. Uh, in, in Egypt, actually, we have a program called Nuafi, 
my Arabic is a, is a bit tricky, but it means commitment. Um, but it also is, a, is an acronym that stands for the nexus of, of water, energy, um, and um, the third thing, <laughs> food. Thank you very much, exactly. Um, and EBRD leads on the energy uh, part of that. Um, and what we do there is the focus is on decommissioning gas-fired power plants, um, five gigawatt worth, and actually commissioning uh, 10 gigawatt worth of renewables. But at the same time, also looking at the, the redeployment of the 10,000 plus uh, people that are directly affected uh, by that. So um, we're working very closely with the Egyptian authorities, with our clients and partners. This was launched also at the COP last year. Um, and we're now having uh, the first projects um, coming through. Um, but it's exactly that sort of reorienting uh, in that sense, uh, or in this case, the, the energy sector, and at the same time also working with our policy partners, but also other partners such as the European Training Foundation, for example, on, on the whole sort of skills side and skills policy side, but many others as well, uh, to make sure that we don't lose sight of, of, of the workers. And then finally, in terms of risks, I think... Very often what is missing from the Just Transition agenda is some of the relevant partners, including on the, on the government side. You always have the ministries for education, economy, et cetera, regional development sometimes. But very rarely is there an input from the ministries for labor, the ministries for education. Um, and it's that human capital aspect and, and reshaping that human capital that is so important that is, that is often missing. So we're trying to, to bring that in as well and work with our partners in this context. Great, thank you. And just from an investment perspective then, is it, are you, does EBRD look for something that is already incorporating those elements or does it also invest in things but work with the partner to include those elements, if you see what I mean? So it's, it's the latter, really. Yeah. So we look at additionality of impact. So if everything is already there, then that's great. Um, but um, where we can really make a difference is if we shape things. So, right. so me and my team, we look at the human capital side of things. So we work with our clients to, to undertake a, a mapping exercise of which jobs will be affected in what way. Uh, we work with other partners, um, for example, in, in Egypt, to use artificial intelligence to understand um, what skills do people actually have beyond their formal skills, what informal skills do they have, how does that link in with the needs of the local labor market, how can we do that mapping, getting the job centers in involved um, training providers, shaping training programs also so that they reflect the needs. So it's, it's, it's very much shaping it as, yeah. as, as we go along. That's great. And how receptive are, I mean, money talks I appreciate sometimes, but how receptive are partners to those ideas? So I think, um, I mean, many of our partners in, in the energy sector are SOEs, um, and they, they do recognize the need to look at uh, the labor market and the social context more broadly. Right. Um, and, um, and certainly when we then, particularly for large programs such as Nuafi, you know, we work closely with the authorities and they fully understand the social implications um, and, and the huge risks that come from uh, not dealing with, with these issues. Right. So, so in that sense, the, the, the question is not, often so much whether we should do it, it's more how do you right. do it? How do you do Pushing it well? How door. do you do it yeah. effectively? Yeah. yeah. And sorry, last question. Um, do you, it, I mean, it, it reads to me that EBRD has always had a seam of just transition running through its work, right? It's always been, maybe we didn't call it that 20 years ago, but it's always been there. Has anything changed recently? Is it in the context we're in now, post Paris? Is it? Yes, I, I think, um, so EBRD had, well, has it always had it? I, I'm not sure. I think there was a sort of um, as, assumption that, yeah. you know, if we invest in a particular sector, in a market, the benefits for people will be there. Right. Um, and then it was about 11, 12 years ago where the, we commissioned a, a life in transition survey and realized that actually the benefits were not always equally distributed right. and sometimes not necessarily there from the transition uh, process. So that's what spurred this focus on let's try and understand how do our investments impact on people and jobs and livelihoods um, and not just how but also how can we enhance that impact. Um, and, um, and that's when this uh, whole economic inclusion approach was, was developed. We had then had our first strategy in 2020. We launched our Just Transition Initiative. In 2021, we, we launched our first Equality of Opportunity Strategy. Um, and that really embeds a focus on that now into how EBRD invests and engages with our clients. But we've been on a journey here yeah. as well. Interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, on the multilateral couch, we've got um, yeah. Carol Cronenberg <laughs> from the Council of Europe <laughs> Development Bank. Um, so CEB known also for social development um, especially, but I, I guess the same question, you know, how are you defining it and why is it so important? And again, if we've got some examples from your world to add some flavor. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for, for inviting us. Um, we are a bit unknown, uh, multilateral development bank, because we have a very specific mandate, which is a social mandate. Um, our organization is, is linked to the Council of Europe, which is based in, in Strasbourg. Um, we have 43 member states. And we operate also in 43 member states. It's a bit overlapping with the EBRD. Uh, so we also operate nowadays also in Ukraine, uh, Turkey, uh, Georgia, up to, but also countries like Iceland, Portugal, and, and Norway even. So it's very much, uh, um, uh, I would say the organization predates basically the, the, the EU in that, in that respect. Um, the, the focus has always been on migration and migration crisis, and that's also the, I would say, the, the, the reason why we, why we exist. Um, but the bank has developed uh, throughout the years very much into a, a bank with a very specific social mandate, which is very specifically focusing on health, education, affordable housing, uh, urban development, and very much microfinance. But the key, uh, the key uh, in, in all our work is, uh, is basically uh, a focus on, on looking everything to a vulnerability lens and um, focusing also on vulnerable groups. And, and that is also how we look at, at, um, at, at, at just transition. Basically, it was very interesting. I only joined the organization a year ago, and the word just transition was not in the DNA of the organization. Um, and, and, and the main reason was that uh, climate change was seen as a, as a cross-cutting topic, as, a, as I would say a, a maker trend, uh, just like you have other maker trends as well, like, uh, for instance, uh, social trends, uh, the migration that's happening, uh, gender, but also very much uh, digitalization and all the things there. And climate change was basically seen in that, in that specific context. Um, but the uh, CEB has, um, has basically been working in the last two years uh, together with the other NDBs in implementing a Paris uh, alignment strategy. And, 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 and climate change has become, I would say, more prominent in the organization. And then we basically also see the importance to look at um, how basically how is climate uh, action impacting the different groups uh, that uh, they refinance. And, and um, so it's, uh, it's very much about uh, what, what, what is just and, and how do we define just. Uh, and for, when we talk about just, uh, it's, it's basically that, uh, that vulnerable groups are not, I would say, impacted disproportionately in a, in a negative way by, by climate policies. Um, and let me give some examples. Um, I'm not going to give the classic example as, as towns where basically mines are being closed and, and people need to be re-employed, but very much about um, an example of uh, what we do in the, in the, in the, in the Balkans, for instance. We have quite a number of projects that are related to, to social housing and to, to housing projects and energy efficiency improvements in, in buildings. And what is very challenging in those, uh, in those um, I would say, uh, projects is how to make sure that the people that are in, in, in most need of, um, I would say, renovations are actually being addressed. Um, because it's very easy to define an energy efficiency program um, for homeowners, and they subscribe to it, but that are definitely that are normally the people that have a little bit more income that, can, uh, that are able to, to finance those, those in, um, uh, to, the, to co-finance those investments, also to take the risks, uh, but how do you really address those people that can't afford that? And uh, for us, it is, um, I don't know if you should call it just transition, but it is uh, very much looking uh, to, I would say, to, I would say, actions that are needed because of climate change and how to make sure that uh, vulnerable groups are, are taken and also benefiting from those, uh, from those developments. Another example is, for instance, um, we're working very closely also with national development banks like the, the Bulgarian Development Bank and the Hungarian Development Bank. Um, and, and of course, they're also thinking about, I would say, electrification and about, I would say, introduce, introducing electric vehicles, making sure that um, also uh, SMEs and small companies uh, are basically having access to those vehicles. But how do you make sure that not only the companies that are, I would say, are able to, to buy those vehicles and able to, to absorb the subsidies, but also the other groups that they're not getting out of business. And we have seen examples of those cases, uh, even in France, uh, where you have these, I would say, emission zones, uh, and people that can't afford to, uh, to buy a, 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 a new van or a better van are basically just getting out of, uh, out of business. So that is very much our, I would say, our approach uh, to, to just transition. 
And one of the risks uh, that we see is that, um, um, well, I would, I would almost call it uh, just transition washing, what could, what could take place. Um, that, uh, oh, wait, wait a minute, we, do a, we, we put a solar panel on a school, okay, that's a just transition project because it is both a social benefit and a green benefit. Um, or that's basically just good practice uh, that you, well, of course, you have always to take into account in every project that you do, that you do no significant harm to, to I would say, social impacts. Um, and um, uh, just that you don't do significant harm doesn't mean that it is a just transition project. So it's very important to think about uh, what are the indicators, uh, what are the standards, and, um, and that's also why we are, I would say, so interested in, uh, in the work that, uh, that is being done by, I would say, the standard setters here also in the room, uh, to see how, I would say, we can develop better indicators to see what are really good, uh, good transition projects. Great, thank you. And it, so it sounds similar to Barbara's articulation that CEB has been on a, a journey to some extent, but it sounded like from what you said, there was quite a sharp, you know, it wasn't a term used a year ago and, and now it is. Was there something that clicked that into place or, or has it always been there and you gave it a no. definition? Or? Basically what has been the, the watershed moment is that we, um, that we got our new development plan, which was approved at the beginning of this year. And the fact that um, uh, one and a half year ago, there, uh, we approved our, our, our Paris Alignment Roadmap. It basically means that we will follow, just like the other NDBs, that all our finance needs to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, and of course, you look a little bit further than just one, Article 21, mm. 21B or 21C. Uh, that it, Paris Alignment is not only about uh, uh, that you, uh, your projects uh, have a mitigation impact or an adaptation uh, impact, Paris alignment is also about that you take into account all the, all, all the other effects, all the other development impacts of, of climate action. And, um, and that makes us think. And um, uh, interestingly, I thought our organization was unaware of, I would say, their, their capacity to, uh, uh, because of the social mandate, uh, also to, to play a role in the, in the climate mm. area, which was, was basically definitely not the case uh, one and a half year ago. Interesting. And just as a last sort of follow on to that, so w one of the sort of patterns I think coming across these three working definitions is around um, the, the need to understand and work with and engage with the community. To what, to what extent are the design of some of these investment criteria from the engagement with the people actually affected or, or is it more of a top down thing? We hope that things are bottom up. Uh, it's very much um, also about building a relationship with your, with your clients or your counterpart. And um, that's also what you learn from the, uh, I would say, for Paris alignment. And, and, uh, and, and because a lot of our projects are, are, are not so well defined at the moment of approval. Right? It's often our frameworks, uh, for instance, if you work together with a uh, with a local financial institution. Uh, it, it's very much about having the capacity at that local financial institution to basically on, on lending. So, um, and also if it's a public institution. So it's very much about, about build, building those relationships um, and, and working on, on, on those aspects. Um, and that, uh, and that, 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 is, that is a challenge. Right, okay, thank you. I think we're getting, getting somewhere. We're getting a definition coming together. Yasmin, um, from Sequoia Climate Foundation's perspective. Thanks, uh, Owen. Questions, yeah. um, so Sequoia Climate Foundation is, is a relatively new big philanthropy um, that came onto the scene a couple of years ago. Let me just start by saying that Sequoia Climate Foundation has nothing to do with Sequoia Capital, um, which is a question I get asked about 800 times a day, especially in a sort of finance-oriented um, group. So uh, let me just put that on the table to start with. Um, and realizing that uh, being in the position between the audience and drinks at the end of the day is not, is not the best speaking slot to have. I'm gonna try to be um, relatively quick and, and let you guys um, you know, do some work and, and ask some questions before you go and get the well-earned drinks. Um, look, for us, uh, Sequoia Climate Foundation's mission is about 2030 climate mitigation. We're about speed, scale, leverage, and probability of success. 
across the philanthropic space, there are lots of different, um, you know, related but slightly different nuances in, in mission. Um, and um, so let me be clear that that's where Sequoia is coming into the equation. That doesn't mean that we can't come together um, for, you know, big, big issues and big questions. And I'll give you an example of how we've done that just before I close. But, you know, turning to the question of a just transition to a net zero future, this is really about energy systems. It's about the energy sector. Um, it is about providing better and more affordable energy for everyone. Um, there are obviously other sectors and, you know, that need to transition, so worth sort of setting that out up front. Transition is one um, way to put it. I just came from the Paris Summit, which I might reflect a bit more on, um, obviously related to this topic, where um, there were a lot of representatives from the African continent who were very clear that transition is not the right way to think about it in the African context. It's about energy transformation. This means deep penetration um, of equitable, clean energy agenda, not necessarily um, transitioning from fossil fuels. So let me throw that into the way that um, our thinking uh, is sort of adjusting. Um, and, and I think just the numbers are really pertinent. Yeah, you have a lot of different, you have representatives of different types of pools of capital here, um, Owen on the stage, which um, each piece of which is imperative to mobilize for uh, this sort of revolution really in the energy sector that we need to see, hopefully, as, as far as possible, see through as far as possible over this decade. Um, but we're really talking about a growth just in clean investment from about one, let's call it one, to around four and a half, five trillion dollars a year. That gap mostly exists in emerging and developing economies or low and middle income economies. So let's be clear that that's also there is, a, there is a clear geographical component of what we're talking about um, here as well. So um, while lots of people in the ecosystem like to turn to philanthropy and think, um, wouldn't that be great <laughs> if philanthropy can come in and fill that gap? Um, philanthropy in total is something like $2 billion a year, and I'm, you know, really scrape, if you're really scraping the barrel, uh, so it's just not the answer and it's not looking to fill that gap um, or to try to, um, you know, in any way displace funding that needs to go into these investments. But really it's here to catalyze um, all the different pools of capital that we need to see coming in. So what, where we work best really is for social safeguarding and looking at, you know, that element of um, development uh, and we can encourage voluntary action. Um, we can also assist government efforts alongside civil society organizations, so that can mean technical assistance. It also means capacity building. Um, that needed to scale renewable energy, but also, in some cases, transitioning from fossil fuels. Um, we also uh, really can invest in sort of market building solutions. So one of the ones that we've been working on together, Owen, um, is the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. Uh, in Paris, um, there was a panel on this and sort of John Kerry showed up, um, sort of rolled in and jumped on the stage and made a much more compelling case for um, uh, why we need to be growing this $2 billion a year market um, into the 100 plus that one hopes it could be on the basis of robust, um, just, and sort of high integrity supply side credits. Um, God, I wish I had actually written some notes from what he said so I could bring some of that uh, back into this room. But, you know, he kind of looked at the audience and was like, well, you know, what are you guys gonna do about it? And um, uh, of course he thinks that carbon credits can play an incredibly important role in looking at market solutions to kind of think through um, how you, bring pricing into mobilizing finance, which I imagine most people here would agree is a critical ingredient alongside government and policy, kind of clear, smart, early direction um, to get us to where we want to get to. So let me just close with giving you um, a highlight ahead of, uh, ahead of Sharm El Sheikh in COP27 last year when a, a coalition of philanthropies came together to announce a $500 million investment over the next three years to accelerate just and equitable clean energy agendas in low and middle income countries. 
Um, so just to say that we are out there, we are um, trying to do you know, what we can in this area, and you know, hopefully we move from success to success over the coming years. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, just a quick question, because we've, the, the others have done something similar, really. That group of philanthropic um, uh, uh, foundations, has that been a similar journey? It has just transition sort of been there from the start and more crystallized now, or was there a turning point? Yeah, I really think that philanthropy has been there right. for quite a long time. I mean, you know, it's lovely for me to be sitting here on the stage, but the people who are actually um, not, you know, not just doing the work, but they understand what the issues are and how to navigate um, the solutions are in country, in region. And I think one theme um, around all of this is that there can't be one solution for, you know, there, there's not one global solution, right? Each country is on a different path, um, whether that's a transformation path or a transition path. Um, and there are just so many specific variables. Uh, you know, the multilaterals have wonderful uh, footprints in each individual countries, and, and that's where a lot of the work gets done. I know EBRD, just to take the Egypt example, has really strong team on the ground working closely with the government. That's really where I think um, you can get under the skin of the just element, but frankly also the economic element, um, because uh, the energy sector, just to state the very obvious, um, is such a politicized uh, part of every economy um, that you really need boots on the ground. So philanthropy, um, you know, has empowered civil society in a lot of these low and middle income countries. And I think and hope that that's where some of the edge can come from in these conversations and in trying to figure out the solutions is with those local insights that philanthropic organizations have been supporting for decades, really. Right, I've got a, this is a difficult question, <laughs> so apologies in advance. But I, I was just thinking, as you were speaking there, that um, in some ways, we, you know, humanity has never managed that kind of transformation or that kind of transition before. So to some extent, we're having to imagine what a post-transition just world looks like. So how easy or difficult is it to do that imagining and design projects to achieve something that it, we, we can't point at something and say, well, look, it worked there, or at least not at scale. So how easy is it to, to actually design things in that regard? Yeah, I mean, it's not easy, as you say. It hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't really been done before, but um, you know, the world has experienced industrial revolutions. The world has experienced planned economies. The world has experienced market-led economies. And I think what we're trying to figure out um, from a Sequoia perspective, more at a systems level rather than a project level, um, is where where's the sweet spot in that combination of, of um, methods and ways to develop ourselves further. Um, and I suspect in the end, it will be some combination of all of those and learning the lessons from the best um, uh, and, you know. And the worst. <laughs> and and ho and hopefully the lessons from, yeah, yeah. what not to try right. again. A bit of foresight and a bit of hindsight then, yeah. And so we come full circle actually from, um, you know, Ollie's uh, investments in, in exactly the kind of work that the Fair Climate Fund um, looks at as well. So as, a, as a, an implementer and a funder of, of community and uh, agroforestry projects, Harry, it would be great to, to round this off with your definitions and your uh, examples. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, <laughs> on this uh, topic. Uh, yeah, I'm from uh, Fair Climate Fund. Uh, Fair Climate Fund is a small company uh, based in the Netherlands uh, with one shareholder, which is Cordate, and that's an international development organization, an NGO. So we come from the development uh, part. And what we do is, uh, yeah, to, uh, we work in the carbon markets and we help uh, 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 to develop uh, projects and to implement carbon projects uh, together with local organizations in the global south um, yeah, to, to help people, uh, the vulnerable people uh, in the global south to get access to the carbon markets uh, and to uh, improve their uh, lives. And the most important part is in the clean cooking uh, sector uh, and that's because, uh, yeah, uh, reality is that uh, 
many people of most people in Africa still depend on firewood and charcoal to cook their meals and uh, that's a big big uh, health problem that's a big uh, development uh, problem household per air pollution is still killing uh, uh, yeah more than three million people each year uh, in the world uh, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, yeah the dirty cooking is uh, creating a lot of problems uh, for the people so uh, uh, and besides, uh, so we help uh, uh, project develop uh, local organizations in the south to to design projects and to implement projects to move to uh, cleaner uh, fuels. And it's interesting to hear the, <coughs> the yeah the the notes on the energy transformation uh, because uh, in Africa because we consider that uh, energy transition in Africa uh, means uh, the transition from firewood to clean fuels. That, because the most important energy source in Africa is firewood and not uh, <laughs> fossil fuels. So that's the energy transition and we help to, uh, <coughs> to make that tr transition. Uh, yeah, the coming to the uh, definition of just transition um, I consider and well I would say that uh, a just uh, transition means that uh, all people in the world including the vulnerable people in uh, in the global south can have a decent living in uh, a net zero world uh, that's uh, the objective and yeah the, the carbon markets are uh, kind of <laughs> A small tool in uh, in that transition. So what we do is, uh, yeah, to help the local uh, organizations in Africa and Asia uh, to register the projects, to uh, yeah, to to help them to in the certification processes, which are complex, to sell the carbon credits in Europe, in where the market is for the carbon credits, and to uh, uh, where possible and where needed. Uh, to source upfront finance because yeah in the whole carbon cycle the upfront finance is a key problem uh, because yeah it takes uh, time to register and uh, get up to issuance and also to implement uh, the projects so you have to invest in in cook stoves and in uh, or in biodigesters uh, yeah so the uh, sourcing the finance is a key part as well uh, we work with the cold standard uh, uh, mainly uh, and on top of that we also work with the fair trade climate standard. So the fair trade climate standard that's uh, an add-on on the, on the cold standard which really guarantees the ownership of the carbon credits to the producers which is often forgotten in the carbon world because the households are uh, yeah, making this transition or uh, the, the switch from uh, dirty fuels and to uh, clean fuels and they are producing the carbon uh, the emission reductions and they should be considered the, the owners. Uh, the Fair Trade Climate Standard uh, clearly uh, acknowledges this ownership and besides that uh, it also has the fair pricing. So like in other fair trade commodities you have a minimum price and you have a premium uh, pri uh, premium uh, on top of the, the normal pricing. And the premium is used for adaptation measures. The adaptation measures, those are uh, defined by the local communities or the small producer organizations. Uh, and so that's what we prefer to work with, with the Fair Trade Climate Standard on top of the cold standard. Yeah, as I mentioned, we uh, work mainly in the clean cooking uh, sector and yeah, we work with uh, multiple uh, technologies. So it goes from the uh, yeah, more efficient mud stoves in Burkina Faso to uh, pellet stoves, uh, which are uh, the clean, uh, yeah, cleaner option, uh, for example, in Rwanda and uh, Zambia. 
And uh, yeah, the biodigesters, which is besides the, the biogas, you have the bioslurry, which is improved uh, fertilizer. And now we have also uh, a, a, a partnership with ATEC uh, for the cooking on electricity, because that's an interesting new development that uh, cooking on electricity is coming up as an option for people in remote areas. And so that's uh, in Bangladesh and uh, uh, Cambodia. Uh, and there we work with the new uh, methodology from the gold standard on the metered approach. And there the, uh, the, the setup is uh, that uh, yeah, you have the remote uh, uh, monitoring uh, real-time uh, uh, verification and that also enables to share the benefits because that's the other part of the Fair Climate Fund that we really want to share the financial benefits with the households uh, and that uh, in the partnership uh, agreement with uh, ATEC uh, yeah, the, there will be a direct flow to the households of the, of the, of the revenues <coughs> of, from uh, selling carbon credits. Yeah, and then also mentioning the, the biodigester uh, projects. So uh, we are talking about uh, small biodigesters uh, at the homestead where, uh, of, uh, of people in Africa, uh, yeah, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, uh, where uh, small uh, holders, they uh, get access to uh, a small biodigester they uh, put in the, the cow dung or the, the pig dung, and it produces uh, just uh, some uh, the cars uh, to cook with on a very clean and healthy way. Uh, and also it produces the, the improved fertilizer, the, the bioslurry, which is uh, used on the, on the crops. Uh, and there is the, yeah, the, the, the gender uh, <laughs> impact really uh, important because it's on the, uh, the, the bioslurry is mainly used on the crops close to home, uh, which are under the women's uh, domain. Uh, so there's uh, a real uh, yeah, control and uh, women empowerment in those projects. And, uh, yeah, the food security, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you. Harry. Um, so mindful of time, I think it'd be great to hear from the audience. So thank you everybody. I think we've worked up a really nice uh, education really in in definitions of just transition some of the ideas around it so it's actually quite difficult to see uh, everybody in the oh, look at that. um that's made it easier um that's the power we wield from the stage um so it'd be great to get a sense of who's in the room first so we'll do this with show of hands and then there's going to be a second exercise we're going to ask some of you to stand up so just prepare for that um show of hands first who's here from an ngo okay so that's a pretty decent spread how about academia Welcome, sir. <laughs> Who's here from a private business? Okay, so there's the overwhelming. And then uh, maybe who's here from a project developer or implementer? Pretty good overlap. And maybe from the audit community? No, no auditors. Mm. Um, and maybe is there any others? Any, anybody have not? Yeah. A couple of others in the room as well. Who, who, who have we got that's not one of those in the middle there? Finance, yeah, thank you. We've got all the finance people on the stage. So. <laughs> okay, so just to stand up then, I wanna ask another question is, who in this room feels that they could say that their work is in some way about just transition, involves just transition? Can you stand up for that one, please? <laughs> Suddenly nobody. <laughs> okay, and does anybody um, sit down if you, uh, agree with the definitions on stage so far, or maybe stay standing if you would like to add something to that. Is there something you feel was not addressed in, in the just transition definition? Okay, excellent, That's strong. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear some of your, yeah, what can we add to the definitions we've heard? Um, apologies in advance if I missed it, because you probably did cover it, but I didn't really hear that much about sort of jurisdictional change, a uh, scale change. And I think for, yeah, for real, in, I mean, obviously bringing communities along, et cetera, but I think the two have to go hand in hand.
I'll really put myself on the spot here. Um, I guess there's a logical component to what would constitute a just transition in the sense that climate impacts will be situated where they will be situated and that somewhere defines where just will end up having to be defined. Um, whoever is hit with climate impacts, uh, whether or not they're equipped with the tools to do so and who gives them those tools and equips them with it, um, that's gonna define where just situations are being carried out or not, I suppose. Um, that's about all I have to say about that. Thank you. Good. Okay, so we add a little bit to the audience, sorry, to the audience, to the panelist definition. Okay, so we've got a good sense in the room and a good sense of a few other uh, additional points there. So um, I'd love to open it up for, for questions um, the last few minutes that we've got. Does anybody have any questions for our panel? Otherwise, we're going to make you. Where's one? Just down here. Put hands up high. I'll pass. Yeah. <laughs> about as far away from you as we could. You could about as far away from you. Okay, thanks for keeping yes. me fit, okay, path. Yes. It's great. I just needed a bit of a workout. <laughs> Hi, I'm Parth. I'm from Pegasus Capital. Uh, we manage the Subnational Climate Fund, um, investing in emerging markets. Just a question, we're all kind of deploying capital on the stage, I do it myself. Um, how long do you find, when you're given some of your LPs and some of you are doing direct investing, how long does it actually take to put the dollars on the ground? And I'm not talking from a debt perspective, because debt guys come in when, at financial close when kind of, you know, yeah, there's the work to be done, but they're not there to take the early stage risk. Um, and kind of work hand in hand with the developer. Um, how do you kind of make that work? Because I used to work at a development bank and the, and the lingo always goes, there are no bankable projects, there are no bankable projects, but then nobody wants to basically put money to work to make a bankable project. Um, so just, just curious, I mean, uh, and, and to make a bankable project, you don't need that much capital. So where I'm coming to is, how are you kind of putting capital to work, and especially for that early part of the financing where it can go to zero, you know? So. Super. Great question. Any, so, more? Sorry. any more? Are there any more? I didn't see any slides. Okay. Well, we, let's take the opportunity to address the, the jurisdictional point and the, yeah. the where just happens point. So I think, Carol, you had something to add to that one. Yeah. I, I was just triggered by the, the man in the back uh, about. Um, um, I would say, uh, different locations with different, um, I would say, impacts on climate change. And I, I, I think there is one thing that we haven't mentioned here. Um, at least that is something very important for the CEB. And that's not only about, I would say, the mitigation policies, but it's also about the adaptation and climate resilience. Mm -hmm. And um, that is hugely impacting as well, um, I would say, the, uh, just to give an example, um, I'm involved in a project uh, for very vulnerable people. Basically, we are investing in prisons in, uh, in, in Serbia. And um, one of the reasons that they need investments is also that the temperatures in these prisons get very high in the summer, increasing heat waves. And we can, well, we need to improve in energy efficiency measures there as well. But there you see, basically, yeah, not only looking at the, I would say, the carbon side, but really we have to combine it also with the resilient side. And that is something that is in the definition is not always taken with it, and I'm not sure how to do it exactly. The, the, the EIB, our colleague, uh, Multilateral Development Bank, they have something developed like just resilience, um, but conceptually that hasn't landed yet completely. Um, so that is also something that, uh, that we need to work on, on, uh, on the definitions. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if I could come to Oli on the on past question, um, how, do we, how easy is it to put the capital to work? How easy is it to find bankable projects? How easy is it to invest in them as a private asset manager? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a great question and one that we, we haven't figured out, I have to say. So we don't have a sort of technical assistance facility within our fund, which is what I would describe as sort of, you know, delivering that sort of maybe two, 300,000, um, you know, high risk that a, a, a project needs to maybe do a sort of light run of a, of a gold standard methodology and really get, you know, to the stage where um, you know, it's then a lot easier to make maybe that sort of $10 million investment. So, you know, at the moment, you know, we are sort of, you know, 
including that sort of initial phase as, as part of our investment. Um, you know, so we have a, you know, a, a, a proponent of, of, of our investment that is, you know, picking up that sort of two, three hundred thousand dollars. But it, it makes it sort of challenging to navigate our investment committee process, to be honest, because mm -hmm. we're trying to hang a very big investment off a very early stage project. So, you know, we, we would love to, to work with the folks in the room, you know, around collaborating on a, on a technical assistance, assistance facility. You know, otherwise our, you know, we have a four year deployment window. We've raised sort of, you know, north of $600 million for our platform now. And typically we see, you know, once we've got to an investment decision, that probably takes us sort of a year of, of diligence and activity. You know, two projects have successfully navigated that so far. We would typically then have a sort of three to four year deployment window where we are, you know, working with that development partner to restore that, you know, landscape. And, you know, we're targeting sort of very large scale projects. So to the question around sort of jurisdictional, you know, we, our community agroforestry program, you know, we're trying to touch over, you know, north of a million hectares, you know, across six countries. So it's, you know, it's going to take as many years of, of, you know, restoration and planting, um, you know, to get there. Um, and then the other sort of thing we try and uh, target with, with our investments, sort of thinking around sort of jurisdictions, is, this, is the sort of landscape approach. So we like to see sort of project, you know, if we're investing into, a, you know, a reforestation project, you know, at the landscape level, you know, we like to see that nested in with, you know, a conservation zone. You know, you then maybe have a sort of productive forestry zone, you know, an agroforestry zone, you know, and then more sort of traditional mm. agriculture so that you know that at the sort of the jurisdiction or the landscape level, um, this, you know, it's going to be working for all the, all the yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. I, and, and Barbara, is, is, it, is it a similar, I mean, you, you work at a different order of magnitude in many ways, but is it a similar set of challenges even at scale? Is it, is it difficult to find bankable projects and what sort of hit rate or failure rate is there at that technical assistance level? Do to, to lots of investments make it through or is, actually, is that quite difficult to get investments to that level? So from our experience, um, we do find bankable projects. The question is, do they achieve the impact that we want to achieve? Um, is it really about just transition or is it a very good green project, which is fine too, you know, but uh, or is it actually neither, um, in which case it, it could be fantastic, but, but not, not for us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, for us, it's, it's more sort of selecting those that, that actually do what we want to do. We do have access to technical assistance and we do deploy it um, for project preparation across a various different um, areas, including on the sort of human capital and, and, and just part of it. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, we are subject to macroeconomic developments, as, as is everyone. So some projects that look good at one point may then drag out for a number of reasons that, that have nothing to do with the actual project, but have to do with the country or the economic situation as it, as it develops. And then sort of, you know, sometimes things take way longer uh, than, than, than we think. So, you know, it's that I, I guess it's a combination of, of, of those two. Yeah, please, Yasmin, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. This is the million, I mean, this is literally the chicken <laughs> and the egg of why this is not moving. Um, just like a couple of points. One is that I think a big part of what Paris and this summit was about was um, try, we need to fill this financing gap at scale. And the only way that's gonna happen is with a change or reform in the way that um, finance actors think about risk. And, and I, that was a big theme um, in, in, at the summit, you know, with all the multilateral actors there in particular, but also the G20 governments um, who own the multilateral development banks. And, um, you know, a big focus that has been put on the new um, uh, MD of the World Bank has been to think about how to make that shift because that, I mean, that is where the market is looking for finance to fill that gap, um, and it can't do it on the terms that it, that it has now. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of constraints across the whole community. So um, I think breaking through that barrier in terms of how multilaterals think about risk is just critical. And there's lots of different components to that from, you know, the political to, you know, current local currency and kind of in, it, um, interacting with also um, indebtedness as a theme. Some philanthropies have gotten fed up and basically started to go fishing with a pole um, and start doing, you know, filling some of these financing gaps on projects. Just a, d a data point that might be useful that answers your question directly is um, philanthropy set up this one, uh, it's called CSEF, S-E-A-C-E-F, 
um, facility to basically do this. I think they've done four projects in two years, but they're now growing it with new partners, philanthropic partners that are coming in, um, and they're going, it's called Allied Allied Climate Partners. They just hired um, one of the VPs from the Asian Development Bank, Ahmed Said, to head it up, and they're gonna go into Latin America, Africa. I, uh, obviously, they're gonna keep CSEF and maybe the, the Asian subcontinent. So they obviously think um, that there's a model there, and um, you know we hope that they're successful, but I, you know, for me, I just go back to the point of, and of course, being Sequoia, I would say the scale. Like, how do you, you know, how many projects need to happen, and can philanthropy really fund that many or fill that gap through guarantee before you reach a tipping point and these things become um, financially viable? And um, I think that's why there's so much emphasis on looking at the multilateral system and, frankly, private capital. I mean, we've been talking about how to create financial instruments that that really um, you know, bring the incentive home clearly from a financial return perspective. Um, the answer remains elusive. <laughs> Difficult. <Yeah. laughs> All right, um, well that brings us, the clock says zero. Uh, we've got one more question. Yeah, to say it fast now. <laughs> Can somebody sing a song? <laughs> to throw the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Thomas Harry from Phoenix, uh, from Phoenix Carbon. Uh, so we're building a risk management platform to um, help investors manage their risks when they invest in early stage projects. So one question I have for the panel today is, can we define um, what is an investable or bankable project uh, more specifically and what are those barriers that you, know, you wish someone could elevate for you? I have to make that a quick answer. So why don't we do a quick round through all of us to say what, what, what's your very quick answer to what a bankable project yeah, is, Oli? So very quick answer is sort of, you know, from a technical point of view, if I'm talking about a nature-based project, you know, something that stacks up on a per, and I'm, you know, we're, we're investing for carbon credits or returns, so something that, that stack, you know, checks out on a per hectare basis for the proposed activity under the methodology, and then, a, you know, a development partner that has you know, the ability, the on the ground network, the, 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 the relationships with the community to deliver the sort of ramp up mm -hmm. to the, the thousands of hectares that, that we need. You know, th those are sort of two critical components. Yeah, Barbara, you're- Well, definitely. we have three criteria. We have sound banking, we have additionality of impact, and we have what we call transition impact, which is our metric of defining um, this sort of transition towards a sustainable, inclusive, green um, um, market economy. Um, and projects have to achieve all three. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. for me, the, the biggest problem, and working mainly, um, I used to work in the, in the private sector, and now mainly working in the public sector, and what I find extremely challenging here are basically the, the political risks. Um, there are a lot of projects that are basically co-funded by public bodies, and every time there is a change of government, projects are being cancelled, are not going ahead. Um, Therefore, it's super important to take the social impacts into account in the social, uh, because if that will lead to, uh, it, I would say, public resistance, it is a, it's a recipe for failure. And that's also the reason why an average wind park in Europe uh, costs 10 years or more to develop. Mm. Well, it's an extremely simple project from a technical and also from a financial point of view. Um, so I see that, I see that as, a, as, as, a, as a huge challenge. Yasmin, you kind of already answered, we're, but yeah. Well, we're probably to. all offending the academic in the room, so <laughs> <laughs> um, with apologies for that, just to reflect back, I think what the practitioners are saying, I think bankable means uh, that there's a financial return on whatever the criteria are for the, um, for the institution that's deploying the capital, and I think it means probability of delivery, so success, you know, probability of successful delivery. Last word, Harry, anything you Yeah, add? well, I uh, understand the question, but I, I think uh, we need to be... Uh, conscious that a just transition means that we, uh, yeah, that we uh, do things uh, for the people who most need it and they are least bankable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and with that we'll draw to a close and um, we have our drinks event upstairs for those that would like to join us. Um, thank you very much for joining us and thank you all, my panelists.